have you folks. It's good to be here. I uh, look forward to Sunday. If you have your Bible, turn to the book of Colossians with me this morning, please. Chapter number one. Father, I pray for your wisdom. I pray for the gift of teaching. Dare not stand up here in the arm of the flesh. Be nothing but dead works. I pray the anointing, the unction, the blessing, open the hearts of the people to receive your word. In thy name I pray, amen. Uh, if you look at verse number um, 15, Colossians 1, 15, the scripture says he is the image of the invisible God. And I'm going to talk about that in another lesson. That's very important. He's the image of the invisible God. Notice carefully, the image of the invisible God. God is invisible. It can't be seen with the human eye. But note carefully, verse 15 says he's the firstborn of every creature. All right, and we'll deal with that issue here in a minute. For by him were all things created that are in heaven, that are in earth, visible and invisible, whether they be thrones, dominions, principalities, or powers, all things were created by him and for him. So here we have the word invisible used again. There are things that exist that are invisible, cannot be seen. But you notice why they were created. They were created by him and for him. We just happen to be spectators <laughs> and have been privileged to come in and view the marvelous works of God. Verse 17, he's before all things, and by him all things consist. All right? That's quite a, quite a statement. They consist. In other words, they have their, they have their structure. They're, they're held together. Why would somebody 2,000 years ago have any concept of a nuclear, uh, of the uh, nuclear structure of anything? Why would they have that? You know, that's quite a thing. Oppenheimer and I and Einstein back in this back in the uh, 40s, Operation Manhattan, uh, they got into something that was had to do with what he's talking about here, and he is the head of the body, the church, who is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, that in all things he might have the preeminence, for it pleased the Father that in him should all fullness dwell. So we have a powerful statement by the Apostle Paul as to who the Lord Jesus is. Now, let me say this this morning. You may be wrong on church polity. What's that? That's the way the church is set up and the way it organizes and governs itself the, uh, and gets into the liturgy of the churches, how churches worship and different this, that, and so forth. That's not an issue. You may be wrong on dispensations. You may be amillennial, postmillennial, premillennial. You may be wrong on uh, the issue of, uh, of, uh, of deacons and pastors and preachers and bishops and, and the church hierarchy and how that one man claims to be the head of the church and sits in Rome and he speaks ex cathedra and he's the vicar of Christ and claims to be all these things. And there are people out there that believe that. They believe that he is the visible representation of Christ on this earth. And they believe in apostolic succession. And so therefore the Pope is all of that. That won't send you to hell. But I'll tell you right now. That sure can be an encumbrance. It can sure get in your way. To understanding the truth. Because if you think that Pope. Is the visible representation of Christ in this earth. You've got a problem. Amen. Now. The most important thing that you can know is this. Who is the Lord Jesus Christ? Who is he? Who is he? You'd be surprised the men standing in the pulpits in churches, especially Baptist churches in this country, that believe the Lord Jesus was a great teacher, special, gifted orator. He worked miracles uh, because he had some kind of a divine connection with God, this, that, so forth, and so on. But they deny 
his deity. They deny the virgin birth. They deny the blood atonement. And they deny the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ. They were taught that in a Bible college. Now, if that's what you believe, if you deny that, you're not a Christian. Fact is, you're headed on your road to damnation and destruction. The only one that can keep you out of the pit, folks, is Christ. He's the only one that can do it. So, who is he? What manner of man is this? Look at the book of Hebrews chapter number 1 and verse number 2. Hebrews 1, 2. The scripture says, Hath in these last days spoken unto us by his Son, whom he hath appointed heir of all things, by whom also he made the worlds. See this? Now the Bible just you just read here, where all things were made by him and for him. Verse 16, Colossians 1. Now it says in Hebrews chapter number 1, Hath in these last days spoken to us by his Son, whom he hath appointed heir of all things, by whom also he made the worlds. The word for worlds here is ion. Okay, there's another word, cosmos, and so forth, that you can find in the Bible. Ion is the word here for worlds. This world of 2021 is different from the world of 1946 that I showed up in. How many believe that? Absolutely. So what the word ion means in context is ages. It's the periods of time. It's the ages. And the scripture has a lot to say about ages. Note how it says it here in Hebrews 1 verse 2. By whom also he made the worlds. He fashioned the ages. He created the ages. And of course you commonly hear it referred to. What you live in is called the age of grace. The grace of God. Truth be, truth be known. And of course I agree with that. But the fact of the matter is. Nobody's ever been saved without grace. Regardless of what age you live in. Because nobody's ever been able to work their way to heaven. But it's the age. It's the ages. All right. Now this gets a little into, a little involved into, into who he is. If you'll go over here to the book of John chapter number 1. The gospel of John 1.1. 1, 1, look what it says here. John the apostle. John the apostle had a disciple. His name was Polycarp. He was the bishop of Smyrna. Polycarp was an old man when they, when they, uh, they murdered him. They killed him. He became a martyr for Christ. I think they burned him at the stake. Polycarp. Polycarp had a disciple whose name was Irenaeus. Or Irenaeus. So therefore we have uh, two dis direct uh, connections with an apostle, John. And John wrote what you're reading here. Now look carefully. Verse 1. In the beginning was the Word. The Word is Lagos as it's used here. And that's important because of what I'm going to say in a minute. In the beginning was the Word. Because there are other words that could be translated Word, Rhema and so forth. But this is Lagos. In the beginning was the Word. The Word was with God. And the Word was a God. That little indefinite article, A, changes everything. Now, if you had a Jehovah's Witness Bible, that's what it'd say. The New World Translation, it would say, he, uh, and the word was, a God. That's what they'd say, okay? That's not what your Bible says. Your Bible says the word was God, okay? Now, this is the Lagos. You remember what I told you about Polycarp, all right? Polycarp, Bishop of Smyrna. I've been to Smyrna. Uh, it's... I think it's modern day Ishmir in Turkey and uh, most of these ch churches of Asia Minor are located in Turkey it's quite a thing to see there they've got a church built on the very spot where the church is supposed to have been where Polycarp was the pastor the bishop of Smyrna this word Lagos let's get into this just a moment and see what we can learn from it the Christology which has to do with the doctrine of Christ who is he this is Christology the Lord Jesus the Lagos, Greek Lagos, Lambda, Omicron, uh, Gamma, Omicron, Sigma, Lagos, all right, is a name or title of Jesus Christ 
derived from the prologue to the Gospel of John. In the beginning was the Word, the Word was with God, and the Word was God. That's your prologue. Prologue simply means before the writing. In pro, la, laga, the writing. Our word uh, uh, here in, in the beginning is the Word, words with God, as well as the book of Revelation. He was clothed with a vesture dipped in blood, and his name is called the Word of God. Now, God manifests himself in a lot of different ways. Christ came into the world as the Word of God. The Word of God in the sense that he's the Logos, but the Word of God in the sense that he communicates. Half in these last days, spoken unto us by his Word or through his Word. Now, that can be viewed in two separate ways. By what he said and who he is. See what I mean? Hebrews 1. Hath in these last days spoken unto us by his word. Christ is the word. Therefore God is speaking to you with the fact he was here. But not only that, what he said. See, and this is the way the text works. And it says here, And he was clothed with a vesture dipped in blood, and his name is called the word of God. These passages have been important for establishing the doctrine of the divinity of Christ, divinity of Jesus, since the earliest days of Christianity. Now listen carefully to this now. I'm reading from uh, some text I took off of the internet. And I read it, read it carefully, prayed over it, and I thought they summed it up pretty good. Listen to this. According to Irenaeus of Leon, remember now, John the Apostle, Polycarp, Irenaeus. Here we have a direct disciple of the Apostle John. Okay? Now you don't get any closer than that, folks. A direct disciple of John. This is long before, long before the Council of Nicaea through 25 A.D. It was long before any councils, any of the rest of it. This is pure, unadulterated Christian doctrine. What did these people believe in the first century after Christ? According to Irenaeus of Leon, circa 130 to 202, in other words, around 130 to 202, a student of John's disciple Polycarp, circa Pre-69 to 156. All right. Polycarp was a contemporary of John. Polycarp lived at the same time as the Apostle John. Now, you think God had anything to do with that? Of course he did. Of course he did. John now has a, an, a, he has a, he has a disciple who he taught directly. And now Polycarp is going to teach a disciple directly who is Irenaeus. But listen to what they taught. Here's what they said. This is what's important. John the Apostle wrote these words specifically to refute the teachings of Serenthus. Now, who is Serenthus? Serenthus is one of those first century Gnostics. All Gnostics aren't the same. All Gnostics do not believe the same thing. But there are general things where you can classify them together. So Serenthus, Serenthus. If, you, if John hadn't written about him, uh, uh, it, rather if Irenaeus hadn't written about him, I don't know if we'd even know he existed or not. But anyway, he refuted the teachings of Serenthus. What did Serenthus teach? Who both resided and taught at Ephesus, the city John settled in following his return from the exile on Patmos. Serenthus believed that the world was created by a power far removed from an ignorant of the Father. You remember that? Father is a demiurge. The Father is a demiurge in Gnosticism. He thinks he's the creator, but he has been created himself. You see, but he doesn't know it. So this is what Gnosticism teaches. You say, well, I'm glad that's 2,000 years ago. No, my dear friend. This country's full of Gnostics. They're everywhere. The world's full of them. But listen to this. Serenthus believed the world was created by a power far removed from the ignorant of the Father, ignorant, and that Christ descended upon the man Jesus at his baptism, and that strict adherence to the Mosaic law was absolutely necessary for salvation. See how he drags the law in? Remember what the Apostle Paul told him in Galatians? He said, O foolish Galatians, who hath bewitched you, bewitched you, cast a spell over you, he says here, the Mosaic law is absolutely necessary for salvation. So why did he put more emphasis on the Mosaic law than he did on Christ? Think about that for a moment. He put more emphasis, and, and, and by the way, you've got to remember this, that this is early, early, early 
in the Christian church. And what Irenaeus is teaching is what Polycarp taught him. And what Polycarp taught him is what John taught Polycarp. All right. Therefore, Irenaeus writes, The disciple of the Lord therefore desiring to put an end of all such doctrines and to establish the rule of truth in Christ, in, in the church rather, that there is one almighty God who made all things by his word, both visible and invisible, showing at the same time that by the word through whom God made the creation, he also bestowed salvation on the men included in the creation. Thus commenced his teaching in the gospel. In the beginning was the word, the word was with God, the word was God. The same was in the beginning with God. All things were made by him and without him was not anything made. That was made. What was made was life in him, and the life was the light of men, and the light shines in darkness, and the darkness comprehended it not. What did he say? He said exactly what John said. That's what he said. He said, any deviation from that now? If you get into any deviation from that, then you get into absolute apostasy. And the sad thing is that there's a lot of it around. <clears throat> Look at 1 Corinthians chapter 8 and verse number 6. Who wrote 1 Corinthians? The Apostle Paul, right? 1 Corinthians 8, 6. First Corinthians chapter number 8 and verse 6. But to us there is but one God. The Father, of whom are all things, and we in him, and one Lord Jesus Christ, by whom are all things, and we by him. See the difference? Okay? That's what you'd call possibly a nuance. A nuance is that there's a, that there's a, that there's, that there's a mystic meaning where they connect the two of them to, together, but there's a little bit of a difference. All right? Of the Father, by the Son... And what creative power did the Son use? The Holy Spirit of God. Everything Christ did, he did it by the Spirit of God. So it says in Genesis 1-1, the Spirit moved upon the face of the waters. There's the first reference to God. In the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. The earth was without form and void, and darkness was upon the face of the deep. And the Spirit of God moved upon the face of the waters. So, the, uh, the scripture is pretty clear here. It's, this helps understand the uh, unity of the Godhead. It originates from the Father, who's the invisible, almighty, eternal being. It is executed by the Son, who's actually created everything. But he does it by the power of the Holy Spirit of God. That's what we're getting into. So what's that make Christ? It makes him God. That's what it makes him. That's what it makes him. It makes him God. Um, in Colossians chapter number 2 and verse 9. If we didn't know, have a little bit of teaching about this, uh, this uh, heresy that they had to deal with, it'd make it a little harder to understand some of these things here. Look carefully. For in him, in who? In Christ, dwelleth the fullness of the Godhead bodily. So, what is the Lagos? The Lagos to a Gnostic is some kind of a divine word that comes from the monad or some kind of a spirit. And it is the divine word of that spirit that comes upon somebody and then leaves that person. And so when John says that Christ is the Logos, he simply said, according to the, according to the Gnostic now, get, don't, get, <laughs> don't get me wrong. According to the Gnostic, he is saying a spirit came on Christ, which made him the Logos, and that spirit left him. And most of them teach that it left him when he went to the cross. And most of them teach, as I read a moment ago, it came upon him at his baptism. That's the Gnostic Logos. Paul says, not so. Paul says, in him, verse number 9, in him how? How in him? In him dwelleth all the fullness of the Godhead spiritually. 
See, that's not what it says, is it? What does it say? The fullness of God had bodily. Why does it say bodily? Because the body of Christ was unique. Unique. There was never a body like his before. There will never be another body like his after. His body was the body of God. Look at the book of Acts, chapter number, uh, oh, what is it? Acts, uh, see if I can find. Let's see. I didn't write the reference down. Where does it say he purchased the church by his own blood? Acts 20, Acts 20, 28. Seems like that might be it. Acts chapter number 20. Let's look at it. Where? Am I right? Okay, Acts 20, 28. Yeah. Take heed therefore to the, unto yourselves and to all the flock over which the Holy Ghost hath made you overseers to feed the church of God, which he, the antecedent of he's who? God, which he hath purchased with his own blood. Now, wait a minute. We're talking about an invisible being. How did he get any blood? Where did God get blood? Exactly. When Christ, when God incarnated himself. In other words, this invisible being became a visible being. If you've seen me, Christ said, you've seen the Father. I and the Father are one. So, he purchased the church with his own blood. So wait a minute. You're saying that the blood of God is the blood of Christ. Yes, I am. And I'm saying that that blood is a very, 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 very sacred, powerful thing. Look at Revelation 1 5. Revelation 1 5. From Jesus Christ, who is the faithful witness. And first begotten of the dead. And the prince of the kings of the earth. Unto him that loved us. And washed us. No, wait a minute, I got that wrong. To him that loved us and loosed us. See what's going on here? A lot of Bibles say loosed instead of washed. Where do they get it? They get it in the Greek text. They get it in a corrupted Greek text. That's where they get it. Verse 5. Unto him that loved us and washed us from our sins in his own blood. Man. And then Acts 20, 28 says it's the blood of God. So God's blood washed your sins away, right? Absolutely. Water can't wash your sins away, folks. Ananias went over there to, uh, to uh, Damascus when, the, when Paul was blinded and while he was in the house there waiting for him, praying. God said, Ananias, there's a man praying. Saul of Tarsus, I want you to go over there and I want you to pray for him. Lay your hands on him. And Ananias said, now Lord, now wait a minute here. Am I sure I'm talking to God? This man's an enemy of the church. He said, go over there because he's a chosen vessel unto me to bear my name, the Gentiles. He went in there and he said to Paul, Ananias, he said, Paul, God has showed me, I hadn't read it in a little while, but God has showed me how that you are a believer and that I'm going to baptize you and wash your sins away what he said was he right you know what a mikvah is a mikvah is a ritual cleansing that Jews performed before they attempted to ascend to the top of the mountain temple mount every time I've been to Jerusalem I go to those steps that lead up to the top of the temple mount there's one of them it's it's place folks I mean, all I can say is it's something else and you go to those steps and go to the bottom of those steps and you can see where the archaeologists have dug out and found the mikvahs. These are ritual baths that cleanse. They get the, the Jews wash themselves in that. I don't know, maybe they, take a, they took a lesson from uh, uh, Naaman where he dipped seven times in the Jordan. Uh, but whatever, nowhere in that Bible does it tell you to wash. In the Old Testament does it say wash your sins away with water? Nowhere. But anyway... This is a custom that they had developed, a custom that was theirs. And so the custom was that, uh, that they, they cleansed themselves and they go to the top of the mountain up there. And uh, this probably weighed heavily on what Ananias said. You see, when the Apostle Peter 
turned around later on and started preaching to the Gentiles. He got to a point in there. Let me show you. Look at the book of Acts. Let's see. Peter. Let's go to chapter 9. See, I don't have the notes for this. I'm just jerking it off the top of my head. And uh, he, went to, he, had the, he had the vision of the housetop. 1043, all right. Okay. Thank you, brother. Now, go back and get the context. In Acts chapter number 10, he's preaching. Now, who's he preaching to? He's preaching to a centurion, a Roman, a Gentile. He's preaching to him. All right, let's go to verse 40. Him God raised up the third day, showed him openly. Here we are. We're getting into the gospel, the resurrection of Christ. Not to all the people, but unto witnesses chosen before of God, even to us who did eat and drink with him after he rose from the dead. And he commanded us to preach to the people and to testify that it is he which was ordained of God to be the judge of the quick and the dead. To him gave all the prophets witness that through his name, whosoever believeth in him shall receive remission of sins. Now watch what happens. While Peter yet spake these words, what happens? The Holy Ghost fell on all them which heard the word. Wait a minute. I thought he had to lay hands on him. No. And speak in tongues. No. What happens here is God is bringing Peter forward in the revelation that the apostle Paul, uh, essentially when Paul showed up, he just spelled it out for all of them to understand. It took a while for them to get to understand what the, what the atonement of Christ was all about. And so here in Acts chapter number 10, he makes it very clear. While he's preaching to them, and here are Gentiles, the Holy Ghost falls on them. I'm sure Peter said to himself, not man, what's going on here? <laughs> In other words, my, Lord doesn't really need me that much. No, he doesn't. He doesn't need me, and he doesn't need you. He'll get the job done. And so he fell on them. And they began to, uh, uh, now watch this thing. Let's go on. I hadn't planned to do this, but look at it. The Holy, Ghost, the, Holy, the Holy Ghost fell on all them which heard the word. They of the circumcision which believed were astonished as many as came with Peter because that on the Gentiles also is poured out the gift of the Holy Ghost. Okay, the Holy Spirit's poured out on them. For they heard them speak with tongues and magnify God. Then Peter, and then answered Peter, Can any man forbid water that these should not be baptized which have received the Holy Ghost as well as we? And he commanded them to be baptized in the name of the Lord. Then prayed they him to tarry certain days. So if they, if, they, if they weren't baptized, then what happens? The Holy Ghost leaves them. Right? No. No. These people were saved before they were ever put in a pool of water. They were born again. They were born again. And he, uh, now when he goes to the, they have a meeting, they have a council in Jerusalem after this. And I don't get off into that. That's a separate thing. But they have a council in Jerusalem. And they confront Peter about this. And Peter says, hold on. He said, I was preaching to the Gentiles. And the Holy Ghost came on them just like he did us. And they are now our brothers and sisters in Christ. And so they finally believed him. And you'll find that in Acts 15. So in him dwelleth the fullness of the Godhead bodily. Bodily. So there be no doubt in your mind, the Greek word is somatikos. You know where I've told you before, soma? Psychosomatic, the word soma, means body in Greek. It doesn't mean like sarkos, which could either mean flesh body or fleshly spirit or fleshly person. See, sarkos. But soma, soma is the flesh and blood, the body. So he says somatikos, which is a form of it. And this means that in him dwelleth in his body. Body, see, his physical body the fullness of the Godhead. That's strong stuff. How many agree with me? Amen. <laughs> That's to me, the, you know, I believe that the Lord Jesus Christ is God of very God. 
And I firmly believe that any deviation from that, I don't care what you hang on your church or what you call yourself, you are a heretic. And you're not my brother or sister in Christ. So in him dwelleth the fullness of the Godhead bodily. Now let's look at something else. Look at Colossians 1.18. Because they like to use this on you. To show you that Christ had a beginning. Colossians 1.18. Have you noticed how that I go back over these scriptures and approach them from a different direction? You've seen them. We've read them in the past few weeks. But see... Here's, here's the way I get things, is when I approach something from a different direction, but it always leads me to the same point. That's how you know. God's in it. Look at Colossians 1.18. Colossians 1.18. He's the head of the church. He, head of the body, rather. The church. Who is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, that in all things he might have the preeminence. Now look at its counterpart in Revelation 3.14. It's an amazing thing that how Peter agrees with Paul. <laughs> they do agree. Uh, Revelation 3.14. Let me get the text open up here. Okay. Some of this medicine I've been taking, I'm getting better, but it uh, still shake. I'm trying to, you ought to try to move a, open up a page in the Bible when your hands giving it this. <laughs> uh, Revelation three fourteen. And unto the angel of the church of the Laodiceans write, these things saith the Amen, the faithful and true witness, the beginning of the creation of God. Now, if you ever talk to Jehovah's Witness, he'll run you straight there because he'll say, see there, the Bible says he's the first of the creation of God. He's the first one created. That's not what it says. It says he's the beginning of the creation of God. The word translated from be beginning is the source of. That's what it means. Relative to all that follow him. See, he's the source of the creation of God. See the difference? He's not created of the Father. He's the source of the creation from the Father. And that's not adding anything to the text because what did Paul say in Colossians chapter number 1? All things were made by him and for him. And there's not, any, there's not a stronger reference in the New Testament to the deity of Christ than that statement right there. Now go back and look at Colossians 1.15. Colossians 1.15 Who is the image of the invisible God? The firstborn of every creature. Notice again, there is a comparison, okay, with Christ and the creature. Now, what does it say of him? Firstborn. Do you know what it calls the church that you're part of right now? It calls the church of the firstborn. What does this mean? It means that the Lord Jesus Christ is the first person born of the Holy Spirit of God. And he was. The Holy Spirit of God said, Gabriel said to Mary, this holy thing which is in you is of God. The Spirit will come upon you. The Spirit of God, the Spirit of God, brought forth into this world the God-man. He did not bring God into this world. This is where we fall out with the Catholics and we fall out with the Eastern Orthodox and we fall out with, the, with all these people who say that, he, that, that, that Mary is the mother of God. No, she's not the mother of God. She's the mother of the God-man when God incarnated himself in flesh. Do you get the nuance in here, the difference, what we're talking about? Uh... uh uh, what is it, uh, Tokakis, I forget it. I forget the word they use for it. But in any event, he's the firstborn, the first one born of the Holy Spirit. Now, let me ask you, have you been born of the Holy Spirit? Of course you have. If you're born again, you have. 
That which is born of the Spirit is spirit. That which is born of the flesh is flesh. You've been born of the Spirit. All right. He was born of the Spirit. But he was born of the Spirit in a different way than you are born of the Spirit. You are born of the Spirit because you're dead in sins and trespasses. See, you're dead in sins and trespasses. He was born of the Spirit because that's the way he was born. That's the way he came into this world. His father was not a man. His father was God. Did John, I'll ask you a simple question. Did the Apostle John believe the Lord Jesus was God? Did Paul believe he was God? Certainly. Did uh, Peter believe he was God? Of course he did. Every one of those disciples. What about Thomas? <laughs> what did he believe? My Lord and my God. Give me a place to crawl under. <laughs> yes, sir. He said, Thomas, come here. Put forth your hand. And No, no, I don't need to do that. I can see. Yeah, that's good enough. Yeah. He was uh, born again. Of course, the new birth does not take place until Christ arises from the dead. That's another study altogether. Because the new covenant is not ratified until the death of the testator. And that's so important to understand. Somebody says, when did the New Testament start? When did it start? It did not start with Matthew. It started with the cross of Christ when he shed his blood. When I say it didn't start with Matthew, I'm, what I'm saying by that is chapter number one of Matthew is not the beginning of the New Testament. It is the death of Christ on the cross. By, and he shed his blood and ratified the covenant. All right, we'll have a word of prayer. And uh, we'll meet again in here in a few minutes.